and from the rest of Africa. On Saturday, leaders of Mali's military coup sat down in Bamako for talks with mediators from the West African regional bloc ECOWAS, which has strongly condemned the toppling of President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita. The coup, the coup leaders, who go by the name National Committee for the Salvation of the People, were celebrated by thousands of Malians on Friday at a rally called by the M5 coalition, which has campaigned for Keita's resignation for months. However, after three days of calm in Bamako, police used tear gas on Saturday when a scuffle broke out between a group of 50 pro Keita uh, protesters and local residents who threw stones at each other. To make sense of this conversation, we have uh, Veronica Wilson, who is a retired senior West African specialist John, uh, journalist, joining us in this conversation. Good to have you, Veronica. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Now, did the recent developments in Mali come as a surprise to you? Not really, because this problem has been brewing on and off since um, 2012. And... Um, of course, it's escalating now, and the West African community are trying their best to um, mediate in this. They sent the Nigerian ex-president, Mr. Jonathan, to go and carry on talks with all the different factions. But that's not, you know, it's not going very well. Mm. United Nations are chipping in to try to see the ex-president. Well, he's not ex, but the, the current president, Mr. Keita. And um, human rights organizations are also pitching in. But it's quite a complex problem mm. because you've got so many different factions playing it out in the territory of Mali. Of course, you've got the old French colonial power. They're there. You've got the Americans who have been training the Malian army. You've got um, the jihadists who are claiming large parts of the country. So the war is quite complex and it's difficult to untangle. And of course, you've got the rich um, gold resources of um, Mali, which is, um, you know, complicating the issue further. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's um, a terrain that you're quite familiar with in terms of your experience. But it, it seems the dialogue between leaders and followership in Africa still revolves around forced longevity. Has this been your observation? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. We could name quite a few leaders who are still there and hanging on to power by the skin of their teeth. Mm. But as long as the army is on their side and all these um, powers make sure that they look after the army very well. They treat them, they pay them well, they have military hospital, they give them enough food. They make sure they keep them nice and, and loyal to their concern. Mm. Now contrast that with what is happening in other parts of the world. In um, Bolores, for instance, it's the police who are more or less attacking the protesters. Now, our police are quite laid back and they don't have the resources to do this with. So perhaps one should start to question really the role of the army in African countries. Right. Technically, for my simple understanding, an army should be there to defend your borders. Now, we're not fighting each other, thank God. So therefore, who are we defending ourselves against? The citizens, it seems. Mm. And as long as um, this is happening, and we're not really questioning what, you know, we strip the, the army to their barracks and leave the civili civilians in peace, then most of these coups will not happen so frequently and, and with such ferocity. Right. That's my sort of humble opinion to mm -hmm. this very, very complex problem. Yeah, I mean, you try to contrast it with, you know, other parts of the world. I'm wondering, why would you say we are still experiencing coup in Africa in this day and age, whereas other nations are debating issues of broad and diverse, you know, citizens' representation and inclusion? Our population is still not empowered to, to deal with their governments. The average woman or man wakes up in the morning. They're not thinking, how am I going to overthrow that dictator? They're thinking, how can I put food on the table for my children for today? Mm -hmm. How can I get them off to school? How can I safeguard their health, especially in these very difficult times we're all living in in the world? So we don't have the economic clout to deal with our, our leaders. And I think until we try and get more empowerment. It's happening very, very slowly. If you think how the, your children are behaving today compared to how 
we behaved in my generation. I've, I've, I've been in this business for about 40 odd years. Mm -hmm. And I have, uh, my child is also following in my footsteps. But it's changing ever so slowly. But without that economic clout, we can't deal with our leaders. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we should all start putting whatever pressure we can to, to make sure the basic infrastructure is there to enable us to really, really start this development process moving. And that comes through economics, right. good health, good food, good infrastructure. And then perhaps we can start to um, see coups lessening a little bit uh, more. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you have a real good stake in society, you're not really likely to destroy it. But the leaders make sure they keep us downtrodden, browbitten, and then they get on with ever whatever they like to do. Mm. Veronica, before I let you go, I mean, I'm just wondering, is the state of our democracy, in your opinion, as a result of the apathy of the followership? You know, since, as they say, you get the leaders you deserve. What's your thought? <laughs> that sounds like so simple, but really, um, if you look around the world, especially since this Black Lives Matter movement, the newspapers are full of stories of successful Black people in this part of the world who are doing incredible things. So it's just that um, um, I was just reading a book recently by a Sierra Leonean of a Sierra Leonean gynecologist who is the Queen's surgeon. Now imagine if our countries were equipped sufficiently to entice all these talented people to come back home, just think how dynamic it would be. So it's not that the, the leaders, um, the, the country gets the leaders it deserves. It's just that, again, back to my point, the economic structure is such that they keep the continent impoverished, making it impossible for any meaningful development to take place. Mm. Just imagine, as I say, all these people from America, from Asia, from Europe, all going back to their countries and turning it around. The leaders will have to sit up and shake up. Mm. And then, of course, there's this underlying thing that we don't mention the ethnic problem, you know, and depending on who you are, where you are, who's in power, mm -hmm. the patronage you receive. So it's not a question as simple as the, 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 the people get the leaders they deserve. They're keeping all the talented people out of them because they're all afraid to get stuck in this malaise of corruption and bad government. Mm -hmm.